We want to remind our listeners that this program is for informational and educational purposes only and not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The Animal Medical Center does not recommend or endorse any products or services advertised by SiriusXM. Welcome to Ask the Vet with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. This is the place to talk about your pets and get advice with a top veterinarian from the Animal Medical Center in NYC. Hear from the leading authorities on animals and give us a call to ask your questions. Now, here's your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Hello. And welcome to Ask the Vet On Demand from Sirius XM and as an AMC podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. I'm a board certified specialist in both oncology and veterinary internal medicine. And I'm a senior veterinarian here at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center in New York City, where I'm broadcasting from today. AMC is the largest not-for-profit animal hospital in the world. We've got a great show today. First, I'll be talking with Catherine Good, my former AMC colleague and co-founder of the Good Life Dog Rescue, a not-for-profit all-volunteer group based here in New York City. While at AMC, Catherine was instrumental in helping us to create AMC to the Rescue. It's our rescue charitable fund and is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. And it'll be great to talk about Catherine about her rescue work as well as her current connection to AMC to the Rescue in her new life. I hope everyone will stay tuned. Thanks to our partnership with Sirius XM Radio, Acevet Podcast is available on all major platforms as well as on the Sirius app. I hope you will like and follow us to stay up to date on timely and important health news. For 113 years, the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center has been keeping families together by providing absolutely the best care for pets. Now, later in the show, I'm going to answer your questions about pet health. But if you think of a question now or anytime, you can email us at askthevet at amcny.org. Again, askthevet at amcny.org. Stay tuned because you sent such great questions this month. I'm going to answer them later on in the show. And now it's time for our trending animal of the month. It's time for the internet's most talked about animal. A field team of scientists recently discovered two rare palace cats, that's P-A-L-L-A-S cats, living on Mount Everest. Palace cats are about the size of your typical house cat. They're often also known as manuals and somehow managed to remain undetected until 2019. According to Dr. Tracy Simeon of the Wildlife Conservation Society's Zoologic Health Program, it's phenomenal to discover proof of this rare and remarkable species at the top of the world. This discovery is extremely important for researchers and conservationists worldwide, and at the same time, these little critters are incredibly cute. Their legs are very short, and their fur is very thick and fluffy, making them look like chubby little stuffed animals. They're actually smaller and lighter than they look because they're mostly fur, and they have wide faces and big ears that make them almost cartoonish. They climb through rocky crevices and cliff faces um, as an everyday activity, but these wild creatures are very aggressive and would not be a good pet. But the photos will just capture your heart. Ongoing research is gonna help to determine exactly how many palace cats are actually living on Mount Everest and will help protect them so they can continue to live their best lives. Just Google cats living on Mount Everest for some amazing photos. This marks the 10th anniversary of one of my favorite AMC charity funds, AMC to the Rescue. This fund was established in 2013 and is a donor supported charitable fund providing free or subsidized specialty care to animals rescued by not-for-profit organizations. And these animals health prevents an obstacle to their adoption. So AMC uses its talented specialist to treat the pets and make them well, and then they can get a forever home. Since its inception, 
The AMC to the Rescue Fund has provided over $1.6 million in donated care to over 600 pets who are looking for a forever home, but are in need of our medical care. AMC to the Rescue has partnered with over 146 different rescue organizations as we've provided this care to these 600 needy pets. So with that, I'm delighted to welcome today's guest, Catherine Good, who's co-founder of the Good Dog Life Rescue, a federally recognized 501c3 not-for-profit rescue group. For over 10 years, the Good Life Dog Rescue has served the New York City metropolitan area with animal welfare advocacy, education, and affordable spay, neuter, and veterinary care. And then, of course, the most important thing of all, pet matchmaking. This rescue used to be known as RescueZilla, and they joined forces with the Bully Project in 2022, creating the Good Life Dog Rescue. And together, they continue their joint mission to create lifelong bonds between dogs and people through rescue, advocacy, enrichment, and education. All funding for the Good Life Dog Rescue goes directly to the rescue's efforts and the dogs because this is an all-volunteer organization. So, Catherine, I'm thrilled to have you on today's Ask the Vet. We have so much to talk about. We do. I'm so excited to be here. So I want to know what motivates someone to start their own rescue. There's lots of rescue groups out there. Why, why have another one? <laughs> well, <laughs> there's always more need, but I think my story is probably pretty similar to a lot of other groups in terms of it starts as a volunteer usually. So in my case, I had recently moved to New York City. I was, you know, in my early 20s back in the day. Um, <laughs> And I was really just looking for a way to, to get involved in the community and meet people. And I've always loved animals. So that seemed like a no brainer. Um, so I signed up to volunteer with the city shelter. And after the orientation, I was just really, truly blown away by the level of need and just how many situations can result in animals winding up at the city shelter. Um, and it was just something I had never really been exposed to, even though I had pets growing up my whole life, you know, but um, it felt simple then. So I just immediately became like really invested and interested and wanted to help however I could. So, you know, dog walking at the shelter turned into volunteering at events and helping with fundraising. And then eventually I became a foster parent. And that was really really what did it for me because fostering made me realize like what a profound impact I could have even if it was just one dog and one adopter at a time I really fell in love with that process of getting to know the animal and and what it needs and being the person that can can speak to that and can set someone up for success um so I started taking on more responsibilities with uh with rescuezilla and then eventually became president and the rest is history. So can you talk, we probably have some listeners who don't really know what a rescue group is or what they do. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what a, a rescue group in general is? Sure. Um, so our group, uh, our, our main goal and the main bread and butter of what we do is we take animals in, whether it's from a shelter or from the public directly, or sometimes strays. Um, or abandoned animals, and we put them into foster care and uh, get them veterinary care if they need it, which 99.9% .9 of the time they do, um, and figure out kind of who they are behaviorally, what their personality is like, um, you know, do they do well with other dogs, are they okay around kids, are they fearful of certain things, um, so we really take our time getting to know them, and then as soon as we feel like they're ready medically and behaviorally, then we start the process of finding them a home. So as an all volunteer group, you know, it sounds straightforward, but it's very much not. There's no, <laughs> there's no typical day in the life um, and things can change really quickly. I think a lot of our time spent is dedicated to our foster parents and communicating with them and really keeping in touch with how things are going and providing any support or supplies that they need. 
And then, of course, the logistics of getting them to and from wherever they need to go, especially the vet in most cases, um, and dealing with those intake requests. So, you know, that could be reviewing animals' information that are at our local shelter that we're interested in taking in and trying to see if we have an appropriate foster home for that animal, um, all the way to, you know, getting phone calls about a dog left in a dumpster, which was a recent, a recent case that we took on. Um, so, so yeah, it can change on a dime, um, but it's a lot of just getting to know our animals, supporting our fosters and having conversations with adopters to help them move along when they're ready. So how does an adopter, well, I guess I should ask the question both ways. How does a person who needs to relinquish a pet find the right rescue group? Because there, there might not be the right rescue group. Every group is probably not the right rescue group for your pet that you would have to give up. And then the, then the other side of the question is, how does a potential adopter hook up with the right rescue group? That's a great question. Um, so for the first piece, so for folks needing to relinquish their animals, um, a lot of times we get um, we get direct emails, but it can be a lot of work because it's not a really centralized thing unless you are you know, talking to shelters that have a brick and mortar facility and you kind of know where to go because they're visible in your, in your community. Um, so a lot of people don't know about us or lots of other little rescue groups. And one of the nice things in New York um, is that our municipal shelter, Animal Care Centers of New York City, um, does a really great job on their website providing a lot of information, not just on the process to relinquish an animal to them, because, you know, most loving pet owners that are in horrible situations where they're having to make that choice don't want their pet to go in the shelter. Um, but they also have a lot of information on their website about how to, how else to find a place for your animal to go. Um, so part of those services are, you know, that they have a network of groups like ours uh, that they can communicate the need out to once they have information from the owner. So that's kind of a way to help find placement with a rescue group like ours without the animal having to come into the shelter system. Um, and there's also uh, the Mayor's Alliance of New York City was kind of the umbrella organization um, for what we call the New Hope Partners of the shelter, which we are one of. And so they have a list of rescues on their website, which is often how people find us as well. Um, but it's a lot of manual work to go down that list and you know email every single rescue group or, or try to look into who are they and what do they do? Because there's a lot of us. Okay, so I just, just for, for people who might need to relinquish their pet, they could go to, is, is the website mayorsalliance.com? Gov.com. Do you know? That's a good um, I would say the best the best place to go is nycacc.org. Okay. All right. So a nycc nycacc.org. Okay. All right. So so if you need to relinquish a pet, try the city shelters and they have information about how to and where you can relinquish a pet. Now, I want a pet. How do I find a rescue group? that has a pet that I would like to adopt? That's also a great question. And also something that can be challenging with how many rescue groups there are. Um, so most of our adopters come to us either just through our network of volunteers and fosters. So they know, you know, they know someone who's fostered for us. And then that person says, oh, I have a friend who's looking for a dog like this. You know, can you help us find one? Um, but Outside of that, it's a lot of um, folks who find us via Pet Finder and adopt a pet. So those like bigger websites are a really great place um, to start, especially if you are looking for something specific. Um, those sites allow you to search by age range, by size range, and by things like are they you know are they okay with cats? Are they okay with other dogs? Um, which are really important things to consider, obviously, in terms of how, how a new pet's going to fit into your home. Um, so that's always a great place to start. Um, other than that, of course, going into, your, going into your local shelter and seeing pets directly is a great choice. But what I love about doing rescue, again, is that 
we know who all these dogs are in the home. So we can really speak to kind of what they need and how they how they would transition to a new home because behavior is not the same in a shelter as it is in a home. So um, it's just great information to have to help you find the right match that's going to fit. So what I realized from fostering kittens for many years is that the kittens that are in my home know who Mr. Vacuum, the evil Mr. Vacuum Cleaner is. And although they may not like the vacuum cleaner, they they sort of like are, are you know, tolerant of Mr. Vacuum and the dishwasher, you know, when that turns on, that's something else that if you're a cat who's grown up in a shelter, you're not going to know what the dishwasher sounds like. And then you're going to be scared of that. And you know that people come and go at our house. And I know my son has friends over and they're like, oh, look at these little kittens. We can play with them. And so being in a home, it, you don't really think about it until you have a foster. And then you realize that that they're much better prepared to go to a home if they've been in a home and and raised that way. Absolutely. You know, and and my kittens go back and forth to work with me. So people who adopt my kittens say they don't seem to mind to get in the carrier. I'm like, well, that's because they get in the carrier every day and they, they you know, go outside where there's honking noisy cars and then <laughs> they come here. So it's um it, it's a big difference. The other thing my kittens don't mind is a bath because they don't have a mother. And so, so they get bathed all the time. So they're not really afraid of being taken a little bath. Mm -hmm. And, and so I don't, I think that that's a really important point about foster animals is a home is, is different than a shelter and a home raised foster animal. You're going to know if they hate Mr. Vacuum cleaner. Absolutely. And we always encourage folks too to, to get to know us and start a conversation about what you're looking for and consider consider a foster to adopt. Because a lot of times, if we have a foster home willing to take the animal on, you know, then we can take an animal we may not otherwise be able to take in. And it might be the fit they're looking for. And even if it's not, we can lend a lot of support along the way and work together to to rehome that animal. Um, but it's great to set up that kind of relationship, especially if you're looking for something, you know, more specific, or if you have a more complicated home environment and you're not sure that your run-of-the-mill shelter dog will fit into that. Um, it's great to like form that relationship and have that support in your journey. So Let's circle around to now to AMC to the rescue, um, which we're really happy to be celebrating our 10 year anniversary of the starting of that. Um, can you talk about how and why AMC the rescue got started? Yeah, I can't believe it's been 10 years, honestly. <laughs> so that's pretty, pretty awesome. And it was great to hear, you know, how many animals have been helped through it. Um, so when I was at AMC working there, I I really didn't know about the community funds that AMC um, has available to help the community and help pet owners that, you know, just might struggle to provide certain types of care. Um, so in working there and being exposed to that, and then on the other side of life, you know, being involved in the shelter and rescue world, I kind of just had a light bulb moment and saw this opportunity to fill fill a gap because there are so many groups like the good life who are you know small and volunteer run we don't have our own veterinarian on staff we don't you know have our own um, shelter environment so we really rely on fundraising to cover to cover all our costs and that can be really prohibitive if a dog needs you know a five thousand dollar surgery um, so seeing that, you know, AMC has all this expertise, like all the specialists, you know, and all of that knowledge on how to fix really complex but fixable medical problems, right? Um, and if we could, you know, garner support for that, then it would plug this hole in rescue and allow rescues to kind of know that there's a resource out there that they can apply for and that could be an option for an animal like that. And then by saving those funds, you know, you not only get the opportunity to help that animal specifically, but it also helps you 
save more because you're able to allocate those resources to other animals too. So it just seemed like a, such a win. It, it really is a win-win. And I guess I should probably just say for our listeners benefit that AMC to the rescue doesn't provide like vaccinations and spays and shots and, and, you know, kind of routine things. AMC the rescue is specifically targeted at procedures that require a specialist of which you're right, we have 130 of them here, and um, procedures that are going to fix the problem so the animal becomes as close to normal as it can and doesn't need ongoing medical care. Um, so it's, it's really for specialty care that, other, that a general veterinarian could not provide. Um, and and it, it's been, I think that it's a, it's a win for the animals. It's also a win for our veterinarians too, because we get cases that help train residents to be better doctors. We get um, cases that we, that the rescue couldn't really afford to fix. And then we get the satisfaction of, of fixing them. We have one now that had a terrible, uh, bad scraped up leg and we with bandage changes we got the skin to heal and then yesterday it got its ankle um fixed because the ankle got broken in the, that whole degloving injury and so it was so good to see see that one get better so can you talk about a couple of the cases that have come well previously from rescue zilla and now uh good dog life sure um, so one of, uh, I would say probably orthopedic cases have been the most common and the most helpful for us. Um, one was, uh, a little Shih Tzu named Bo Casper, <laughs> and he came to us from, from a local shelter. Um, but once we got him into foster, the foster noticed him limping a lot on his rear leg. So we took him to our, our normal vet. Um, and they, they identified that he might need an actual like FHO, like hip surgery, which obviously we were not expecting <laughs> when we took him. And, you know, and a lot of times it's just not easy to identify these things in shelters because things are busy and you don't have a lot of like one-on-one -on -one time with the animals. So we learned that we weren't sure if he would need the surgery, but we were able to apply for the program to find out and have that consultation at AMC. And he he wound up needing it and getting it. And the great thing was that once once he was scheduled for the surgery, we were able to kind of start the process of promoting him for adoption and find him a really lovely family that that was a really relieved that that would be taken care of and that wouldn't be a burden they had to take on and B, they were, you know, very willing to participate in that process and, and see him through the recovery once the surgery was done, which was great because, you know, that way we can get him the care he needs. He find his adoptive home, the adopters, you know, aren't, aren't saddled with a huge cost right away. And, and he can move along as, as soon as he can and open up that foster spot for someone else. So that was, that was one great one. And then another one that comes to mind is a big, goofy, pity type dog named Gus, who is a huge fan favorite in our, in our world at The Good Life. Um, and he, we fell in love with him at the shelter as well, but he had a lot of orthopedic issues and, and it wasn't really clear you know, it's, it seemed like there might have been some past trauma um, and multiple limbs were involved. So we're like, OK, he's a large breed dog. <laughs> he's got these potential problems. He's very heavy, although, which is a, a factor for adopters if, you know, if surgery is involved and you need to help them along. Um, so we weren't really sure what what his prognosis would be. But again, we were able to, to get that consult and work with, um, I believe it was Dr. Schwartz, who was amazing with his case. And they thought he might have a cruciate tear, but they wound up doing um, a procedure to kind of get, get a camera in there and take a closer look. Um, and he did have some old trauma. They removed some mineralization in the joint, um, but there was no tear. So that was great news because it was a smaller procedure than we were potentially expecting. Um, it fixed, you know, and improved the problem for him. And then he was able to just be managed with, you know, case by case 
seasonal, you know, pain management when the weather gets really cold or <laughs> he feels particularly arthritic, but um, he is living his best life up in Vermont with, with his adopter, Rebecca, who became a super good friend of mine during that process. So, oh, uh, so I, I think that's a good um, lead into what if somebody wants to get involved um, with your rescue group or any rescue group, what, what information can you share about being involved in the rescue process? In terms of volunteering and like yep. mm -hmm. being involved in the work. Yeah. Um, well, I would say it's not necessarily one size fits all. So I think first, first step is to kind of get to know what groups are in your area and kind of do a little do a little research on the work they do and and see whose work kind of draws you to them and and then the needs are you know there's general needs that all rescues need which is you know foster volunteers for sure um and i always tell people fostering is not forever and and you might not know it but sometimes even a week of opening your home to an animal can make a huge difference in um in a rescue's ability to to help them and to care for them so Offering that time is great, um, but groups like ours also need a whole lot of other things that you might not even think of, and you might have skills that they can utilize that you might not like connect the dots on. So, for example, you know, when you start a rescue organization, you don't really expect to, you know, you're not really thinking of all the all the business odds and ends of it and running a website and, you know, creating graphics, there's all sorts of things that you could donate your time to do, even if you can't take an animal into your home or adopt an animal. Um, so I would say, you know, just start a conversation, just reach out and just offer, offer your time and an ear and, <laughs> and your skills. Um, so in our my intro, I've said that last year, uh, Rescuezilla joined with the Bully Project to create this new The Good Life Dog Rescue. What what was the thought behind that combo? Sure. Um, so the Bully Project was a group that we had, you know, that we had been friends with and and kind of leaned on to bounce things off of, you know, for a long time or like past adopters along to each other if if I didn't have the right animal, but they might. Um, so they were always a group that I had a lot of respect for. Um, they have a lot of expertise and have been doing this work for a long time. And we both have a big interest in training as well, um, positive reinforcement training and, and enrichment and all the ways that we can make our dogs' lives better. Um, so there's someone that I've always really trusted um, in terms of guidance and decision making and opinions. So that's kind of how we originally became connected. And then when COVID happened, um, you know, everything changed and we started working together much more closely. Um, and it was just kind of a natural, natural merge from there. And being one team has really helped us kind of say yes to, to dogs that are increasingly complicated um, at a time when, when adoptions are kind of slower and requests to take dogs in are increasing. Um, so it's really benefited us and also provided more support because this work is really difficult some days and compassion fatigue is a real thing that we deal with. Um, so having a bigger team of folks you can lean on is great for that too, so that we can keep doing this work for a long time. So your comment about increasing relinquishment of dogs caught my attention there because during the pandemic it seemed like there was there people wanted dogs and there weren't dogs to take care of mm -hmm. so it is you're seeing an uptick now yeah i would say 2020 obviously you know there was huge demand and we you know probably doubled our usual numbers in how many animals came through our program that year but by 2022 last year you know and it's not just us we've you know, heard this from across the country where local needs have really increased. I think a lot of economic changes, you know, have forced people to make decisions that they wouldn't otherwise make in terms of relinquishing their pets. Um, so we've seen 
kind of that combination of increased need for surrenders and slower adoptions, especially for dogs and large dogs. Um, and I think I would say like our intake types, uh, almost half of our intakes last year were owner surrenders, which is very abnormal. Typically we get most of our animals from the shelter. So it's kind of shifted where, you know, we're keeping animals out of the shelter because owners are coming directly to us. Um, or we're, we're also finding a lot of strays as well. So that's, that was about 28% of our, or 24% of our intake last year was strays. Oh, so uh, you probably have 30 seconds if you want to make a final comment because we're getting a message saying it's time to move on. Do you have something you want that I didn't ask that you want people to know? Sure, I would just say, I would say animal rescue is not one size fits all. A lot of people think all of the animals are abused and neglected and well, that definitely goes on and it's horrible, that is not you know, that's not everyone and that's not every animal and that's not everyone's situation. And this work is just as much about the people as it is the animals. So we really, we really love, you know, seeing those connections that we make. Most people in the world are loving and want to do right by their animals. So creating, you know, being able to help people in a really horrible time and also creating these, these new families and new connections is, you know, what keeps us doing it. Oh, what a great note to end on. So thank you, Catherine Good, co-founder of the Good Life Dog Rescue for joining me here today on Ask the Vet. If you have a question about your pet's health, just email and I'll answer your question on next month's Ask the Vet show. Don't forget our email address is askthevet at amcny.org. And now we're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back with animal news. So I hope you'll stay right where you are. Now more of your pet questions answered on Ask the Vet with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Call now with your pet questions on Sirius XM. Welcome back to Ask the Vet. It's time for the animal news. It's time for Animal Headlines, the biggest animal news from across the world. Our first story today is a new one. First time in 400 years, two beavers have been reintroduced to the wilds of Hampshire, England. And these beavers are appropriately named Hazel and Chompy. Um, these beavers, it, England doesn't have beavers because they were hunted to extinction for the fur. And these toothy creatures are now in high demand for their natural engineering abilities. Beavers offer a nature-based solution to improving the health and function of river catchments because they build dams and then dams hold water. And that helps to um, adjust the flooding, help prevent flooding um, because the beavers are building dams. Eurasian beavers were released onto a thousand acre private estate in Hampshire that was redesigned with an edible landscape. I love that edible landscape exclusive to the beaver habitat. And so if you're interested in photos and more information on the British beavers, just Google beavers settle in Hampshire, England. Our second story is about music composer Noam Oxen. And he found a creative way to honor the memories of beloved pets who have died. In what started out as a project he called Symphony, Oxman transforms the pet's memories into beautiful songs written in musical locations that draw quite literally from the pet's own images. And the results are absolutely amazing. Oxman said, I'm 100% emotionally attached to my work because I love animals more than anything else. So to fully appreciate his work, you need to Google Noam Oxman or visit Symponies, that's S-Y-M-P-A-W-N-I-E-S -E on YouTube or Instagram. And our last one is about a baby, but not a human baby, a baby seal. Baby seal was found alone in the middle of a busy road, enjoying the snow in Cape Elizabeth, Maine local police officer managed to get the little creature back into the ocean until the next morning when the baby seal was again in the same neighborhood. 
that made the police officer wonder if this little guy might need some extra help. And so he was taken in by Marine Mammals of Maine Rescue Center. It's kind of a theme for today, rescue. An examination by the folks at the rescue center showed that the seal was underweight and having a tough time surviving on his own and in need of nutrition until he was well enough to be released back into the ocean. So for now, he's enjoying the company of other seals and getting lots of rest. Just Google baby seal found in Maine for some amazing photos. And our final story today is about rabbits as pets. Even the wonderful crazy cat lady Beth Stern now has Jessica Rabbit Stern and Sunny Bunny sharing living quarters with her own cats and fosters. Nowhere are rabbits as popular as they are in Hong Kong, which I find really surprising. And bunny resorts are opening up all over Hong Kong. These resorts cater to the animals' every needs to keep the rabbits healthy while their owners are away. The bunny resorts offer regular exercise, parties, spa treatments, hair brushing, nail trimming, and plenty of carrots. There's also a social interaction time every day for the bunnies and lots of enrichment activities. So if you need a place to take your bunny while you're in Hong Kong, just Google rabbit resorts in Hong Kong. If you have a question about your pet's health, just email me your question and I'll answer it on next month's Ask the Vet show. The email address again is askthevet at amcny.org. Finally, dog moms and cats, here's a timely bit of information for you. The American Animal Hospital Association, or AHA, recently convened a task force to update its guidelines on canine vaccinations. The vaccinations were reviewed in two big categories, core vaccines, vaccines that every dog should get, and non-core vaccines, those vaccinations based on a dog's lifestyle, geographic location, and risk of exposure. You can learn about these revised guidelines and how they might affect your dog on my blog. Just log into AMC's website and in the search bar, put what vaccines does my dog really need? AMC's web address is amcny.org. And now we'll take some questions from our listeners. Okay, the first one is a question about vestibular disease from pet parent Gracie. Do you have some exercises or therapies to help with the recovery of the effects such as head tilts from peripheral vestibular disease? So peripheral vestibular disease in dogs is kind of like vertigo in people where they get really dizzy and they will often fall over um, and they'll be nauseous and not feel very good. Most dogs will compensate for that dizziness kind of by tilting their head to one side. And so Gracie's asking if there are exercises to help a dog recover their balance better. I don't actually know that we've ever sent any patients to AMC's uh, rehab physical therapy service for vestibular disease, but that would be the place that I would send a pet like that because uh, the rehab service has special slings that suspend from the ceiling so that an animal can't fall over but can practice using its legs again um, after a a surgery, uh, or in this case, after vestibular disease. So for Gracie, I would say, um, check with your local veterinary rehab center, and they probably can help you with some exercises for your pet suffering from vestibular disease. Okay, next question is from Heidi. She sent a question about testosterone. Is there any evidence to show that testosterone replacement therapy for a month or two after neuter is beneficial in supporting bone growth and helping to decrease capital physis fractures in early neutered large bred kittens such as Maine Coons? So a capital physis is the very end of the uh, femur, the big thigh bone, and the capital physis is a round bone that fits into the hip socket. And the capital physis is the, the top of that hip bone, and the physis is where that bone grows. And in these large breed 
um, kittens, they will often slip that um, round part of the bone off the, the rest of the bone, and that's called a capital physis fracture. Um, and I don't know that it is a testosterone problem that causes these slipped capital physis because we see them in dogs as well that maybe have not been neutered. So to best of my knowledge, giving your cat testosterone after neutering them um, is not something that would make a difference. I, I would say though that in, um, in dogs, I don't know of any people that are looking at this in cats, but in dogs, certainly there have been orthopedic diseases that have been tied to early neutering in dogs. So be sure to talk to your veterinarian before you neuter either your dog or cat and make sure that you're picking the best time to neuter that particular animal. And we have a question here from Peter. Yes, Peter was on the AMC's website researching paw handedness in cats. Uh, with his own cats, he has observed that they all have a default positioning of their tail. Uh, so as when at ease, the tail curls to the left. Peter is guessing that eventually he will find a cat with a tip curl to the right. So Peter <laughs> wants to know if you or others have observed this to see if there is a correlation. And I, I just have never, I have cats as well. I've never thought of this, so this is interesting. So, so I me mean, neither. I haven't thought about which way their tails curve at all. Mm -hmm. And so then I immediately on seeing Peter's kitten rushed to my kitten pen, but my kittens are really little and their tails are kind of straight right now. So I'm going to, uh, they need to get a little bit bigger. So paw handedness is, are, is asking the question, is your cat left or right handed? And if you observe your cat doing things, you will see that your cat is more likely to bat at an object with their right hand or their left hand first. Or if they're reaching for something, they will reach left over right. So there, there are distinct differences in cats and cats can be left or right handed. So I think that, that coming off knowing that, that cats can be left or right handed, that's where Peter's question comes from, where which way does your cat's tail curl? The other question that that brought up in my head was, if you've ever known a Siamese cat, they often kind of have a kink at the end of their tail that either goes left or right. And so the next time you see Siamese cat, I'm going to start keeping a mental tally of whether or not those cats kink left or kink right, because I, I don't honestly know the answer to either of those questions. But Peter, this is a great question with food for thought and, and um, Katie and I are gonna be watching cattails like crazy for, for the next six months. We'll report back to you or send us another message if you figure it out before we do. We will do a study on the percentage of left and right hand in cats. Well, that's on the blog that Peter was looking for. So he- I can't remember whether cats are more left or more right-handed, but but there is a blog. If you go to AMC's website, put in the search bar, left-hand cats, it, I, that blog will come up. Okay. We Our got final... one last question from a Doberman owner. Yep, the final question is wondering if their pups enlarged heart and diaphragmatic hernia are treatable. So I don't know about their particular dog, but I do know that AMC's cardiologist frequently treat subaortic stenosis in dogs. And they do so non or minimally invasive by passing a special catheter up a blood vessel, snaking it into the heart, and then they blow up a special balloon that's part of that catheter and stretch out the narrow or stenotic part of the aortic valve. So um, if, if your dog has a diagnosis of subaortic stenosis, they need a board certified cardiologist who can determine if that particular procedure is possible in uh, the dog. And then a diaphragmatic hernia is uh, something that is a surgical disease. So diaphragmatic hernia, the diaphragm is the muscle that goes up and down to breathe in and out. It also is the divider between your chest cavity and your abdominal cavity. So in dogs with a hole in their diaphragm, uh, abdominal contents like intestines will slip through that hole. And when you do um, a chest x-ray, you will see 
intestines touching the heart, which is not supposed to happen. And so diaphragmatic hernias can be congenital, meaning present at birth, or they can be traumatic, meaning hit by car and the force of the car accident tears the diaphragm and makes a hole. Um, either one of those is potentially fixable. Um, it requires a surgical procedure to do so. Um, but AMC's surgeons uh, fix dogs with diaphragmatic hernias all the time. Um, if you are interested in more on hernias, uh, there's a variety of kinds of hernias that dogs have, then I suggest that listeners go to AMC's website, which is amcny.org, and put hernia in the search bar and a blog on different types of hernias will come up. And now we're going to take a short break. And when I come back, uh, we will talk about the Animal Medical Center. Now, more of your pet questions answered on Ask the Vet with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Call now with your pet questions. So welcome back to Ask the Vet here on Sirius XM. Don't forget, you can download this as a podcast. Just put Ask the Vet in your podcast platform and you'll know every time a new episode airs. The USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education is a great resource for pet parents everywhere. I hope everyone who's listening is taking advantage of all the trusted pet health information that the USDAN Institute has to offer. We've got a free pet health library and new entries are entered into that library all the time. This is the leading online user-friendly platform and it's your A to Z guide for common pet health conditions, clinical signs and wellness tips. We also have a children's education section that contains free resources for teachers and caregivers with, for children who are interested in animals or in veterinary medicine. And it, these uh, educational resources offer ideas and tips for lesson plans or things that you can do with your children on a rainy, snowy afternoon um, when you need to entertain them. You can also stream our how-to videos, which have step-by-step -step information on caring for your pets at home. Uh, they're my, one of my favorites, and actually one of my clients' favorites, is the two-part video on how to set up sub-Q fluids in your pet, and then part two is how to give sub-Q fluids to your pet. Uh, the USDAN Institute also puts out a free weekly newsletter that has important pet health information and information on upcoming USDAN educational events. Our latest information on pet food recalls that could be affecting your pet are also posted on the USDAN website. Every month, the USDAN Institute hosts free, virtual, and health pet health events. That means anyone anywhere can participate in these educational opportunities. If you can't make the live stream, then you can go to our website and we archive all our used and events uh, on our website, including AMC's Pet Lovers Book Club videos. You just need to go to amcny.org backslash used and institute. U-S-D-A-N-I-N-S-T-I-T-U-T-E. Our next pet health event is Dental Care Basics, Strategies for Protecting Your Pet's Oral Health, and that will be on Wednesday, February 15th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, and it will be hosted on Zoom. AMC's lovely uh, dental resident, Dr. Ada Toe, will discuss what dental disease uh, means and what you can do to help your pet uh, keep their mouth clean and healthy. Registration is always free, but it's required so that we know where to send you the Zoom link. I want to thank my special guest, Catherine Good from the Good Life Dog Rescue, and to everyone who has downloaded the Ask the Vet podcast. We really appreciate your support. This month, because we're celebrating 10 years of AMC to the rescue, I also want to acknowledge and thank everyone who has supported that fund from AMC veterinarians who, who take care of these wonderful animals looking for a forever home and all the donors who give the money that allows us to provide that care. Don't forget, 
you can you can leave me a message if you have a question about your pet's health. Simply email askthevet at amcny.org and I'll answer your question on next month's show. This month's questions were exceptionally good and I'll keep those ones coming. We hope you'll check us out on our social media platforms. Facebook, it's The Animal Medical Center, and we're currently streaming sushi and sashimi on AMC's Kitten Cam on our Facebook page. Twitter and Instagram, it's amcny.org. Be sure to like and subscribe where you listen to podcasts so you get the new episodes of Ask the Vet. And I'll be back next month with our next installment of the show. Have a great month, everyone. And thanks for listening.